My name is John Wedger. I'm a retired Metropolitan Police Detective. Um, I specialised in child abuse and vice investigations. I came to prominence um, internationally, nationally and locally for my stance as a whistleblower for exposing the deliberate, systemic and institutional cover-up of child prostitution. And moreover, and more importantly, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Have I always believed in God? Oh, yeah, I mean, I um, I was brought up in a, a Roman Catholic family. I went to a um, Catholic primary school, which was incredibly strict, you know, back in the 70s. We'd come from central London where we lived and then moved out, and um, as did a few other kids, and they started setting up the new towns just outside of London. So it was, it was um, a Catholic upbringing. We, I lived on an estate, and the majority of the kids they said they were Church of England, but they weren't. They never went to church at all. Uh, whereas the Catholic kids, we, we did go to church. It had a, a window down the side, and as we were in church, all the other kids from the estate would come and bang on the window and, and basically take the mickey out of me for being in there. So that that was really like uh, my introduction to God. Um, but I, I always believed in God, and I always uh, knew that I was accountable. I was spiritually accountable to something. Um, and as life went on, I would end up in situations where I thought, I'm never going to get out of this. And I would pray, and I would get out of it, you know? And it was like the grace of God. Um, and there was, a, there was a real defining moment. Well, there was a few, but um, one real defining moment, which, which not only pushed me closer to God, but actually pushed me away from the church um, at the same time. I couldn't imagine living in a world where there wasn't belief in God. I've never warmed to um, atheism. I had a, my best friend, he was, um, he used to call himself an agnostic, um, but my best friend committed suicide. Uh, my best friend's mother then committed suicide. And then my best friend's sister, she then committed suicide because her father was an abuser. So yeah, my mate didn't believe in God or, or didn't really see God as a mainstay in his life because where was God when he was being abused? And where was God in his moments when when he needed salvation and um, needed help? So I sort of got where he's coming from, but it's not my thought pattern, but I never lived my friend's life. My real dad died when I was quite young. My stepfather was a man of extreme violence. When I say extreme violence, I mean extreme violence. None of it was ever met out towards me. He loved me and looked after me, but he was a, he was a dangerous man. And had the police had known of his existence, there's no way I would have ever got a job um, as a police officer, no way. For me, it was God, 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 and Jesus was just an offshoot of it. And my life, my life turned um, when I become uh, a police officer and I started dealing with humanity. Now they say about people, you look at what someone does for a job. They either put their effort into things or they put their effort into people. Uh, I started putting my effort when I left school into things. I was a trainee architect and I didn't like it. Then I worked on building sites on the tools, and I didn't like. I didn't, I didn't mind it, but it wasn't me. I wasn't that practical sort of finger dexterity sort of person. But my skill come when I dealt with people. I had this innate ability to communicate, which is something that the the police really nurtured and, and enhanced. I joined the police in my early twenties, uh, in the early nineteen nineties. I didn't want to be a policeman. I wanted to be a diver. I love swimming. I would have swam to work if I had the opportunity. I joined to become a diver because they had a diving unit. Uh, I hated um, my police basic training. It was very military. They say that it's a civilian police force. It isn't because we had military drill instructors. They come from the guards regiment. 
um, they made us march everywhere they made us parade I hated it and it was quite funny because my stepfather came to my um, passing out parade and uh, uh, he was a big guy he was just short of two meters tall and he was built um, like an ox he was incredible he used to fight for money um, he actually won a fight against a bloke called Gypsy Johnny Frankham who was um, a bare knuckle champion and my stepfather beat him and paid for his house bought his house with the money from that and that's what guy was and, and at my passing out parade uh, in the police um, there was a lot of lads that come from and, and girls that come from military backgrounds um, and a lot of them had come from out the military a good percentage of the police recruits were ex-military and this marching thing they loved it whereas I hated it and I couldn't march to the beat of their drum I couldn't I was always out of pace out of step I had to what they call TikTok. I had to quickly skip a jump to catch their beat and I just couldn't do it and uh, my um, passing out parade was <laughs> it was just like um, I don't know what it was like, like a load of, uh, oh, for me it was like a wild chimpanzee running around the parade ground in, in respect to my marching, it was just appalling and some guy laughed at me and uh, the next thing my stepdad had got him by the throat in the middle of the, my past outbreak, my stepdad had grabbed him. Um, so I, I didn't like the police, I didn't like that disciplined environment, I couldn't stand it, I couldn't wait to get out of it and then I did get out and I went onto the street and I started dealing with people and this is where my life changed because I started to shine I started doing incredibly well I then ended up uh, in a relationship with, with someone and uh, it went on to become a very abusive very volatile uh, very unhealthy relationship and it, uh, in the end uh, I didn't realise that she was a class A drug addict she had been taking my money she had been doing all sorts behind my back um, and she ran off and left me with four children. The youngest one was uh, nine months old. So I ended up as a very young boy uh, with four children to bring up. Um, the older two weren't even my children. They stay with me, they're still with me to this day. I love them dearly, they're the centre of my life. My policing career was just was just blossoming, it was blooming. I, it was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. I never had to um, try at it. It's a bit like a, a natural athlete. You know that they've got this natural sort of dexterity and balance. Uh, for me, this was my um, this was my platform, and it caused a lot of jealousy. I started recruiting informants for um, very very high level cross county and international crime, which some people had, had sort of been trying all their career to get. I was getting it in, in the very early infancy of my service, and it caused a lot of problems with people and a lot of jealousy. Um, but I didn't care. I was. Um, like a one-man crime uh, squad as it were um, I was doing incredibly well and um, I started uh, then sort of looking at people and coming in contact with people that um, were on the street drug addicts um, beggars vagrants homeless and they started telling me of their life and it all sort of steered around child abuse and as more as I wanted to move away from children, because I was looking after children, the more children cut, step up, start to come into my life. You know, on a personal level, there'd be local kids would would, would come round there that come from bad backgrounds. Um, there would uh, work. The cases just kept coming towards me and towards me. Um, and I start realising that this was this was a battle of good versus evil. I whistle blew against a deliberate, um, systemic. An endemic and institutional um, child abuse that was that was um, infesting our society and causing basically all the rot. And uh, I had a lot of children come forward to me and started talking about their involvement with this, how they're being used, how they're being pimped out, involved in prostitution. And I spoke out about this. And what happened then was I was silenced. I was um, aggressively and brutally silenced by a very very senior officer and I was threatened with the loss of my home my children and my job if I continued to speak out and told that I must shut that F up and never ever look into this again I was told I didn't realize how deep I dug and what I was on I was on the very precipice the very edge of, of a big dark ravine of pure satanism and I had no idea of it no idea what world I was going to walk into and that then um, really was the catalyst for a lot of years of torment 
there was a lot of bullying to silence me it, it pushed me to the point of alcoholism uh, mental health breakdown um, all sorts and then I had the strength um, after the death of one of these poor little children that, a brave little girl that come forward and really had exposed the sheer extent of the child prostitution a little girl called Zoe um, and she uh, spoke out was our key witness they'd uh, scaled down this huge monumental investigation and this poor little girl was found dead in mysterious circumstances and that was the main turning point because the police didn't care at a high level they had no interest um, in what these children were going through none whatsoever so I made allegations of corruption uh, against senior officers malfeasance in a public office very very severe um, allegations to make and I made them and I stood by them um, and then they really came for me these attack dogs which are the upper echelons of the British police namely the Metropolitan Police that is seen as a benchmark of decency um, and an uncorruptible force throughout the world well let me tell you something you may have corruption in, in poorer and more third, second and third world countries, but it, it's over and it's in your face. We have corruption in this country. If we are the inception, the benchmark of policing, sure enough, we are also the benchmark of, of very covert and satanically linked to corruption. And that's something that I found out. And. Um, there was then this four year campaign basically to, to have me sort of um, imprisoned, have my children taken off me and have me swinging from a rope um, in respect to suicide and they did all they could. And the main defining turning point that really when I was at my lowest ebb that I'd walked out of the police, I'd made these allegations, a little swig of tea. I'd, um, my career was in tatters. Bear in mind, the threats that are made, you will lose your home, your job and your children. Um, my job was gone. There were nine allegations which could have got me a minimum of a two year prison sentence apiece. The more severe one that was made against me, levered against me, carried a 15 year prison sentence. So I thought I'm going to prison as a police officer. Not a nice place to be. I was looking at losing my home because the Metropolitan Police had stopped paying me for almost a three year period. And then they said, and your children. Now, I didn't realize the depth, and I mean the depth of depravity and corruption that they, they will stoop to at very senior level, bear in mind, very senior level this was sanctioned in order to silence me. 2017, I was um, working for cash. I was working as a laborer on building sites. Um, I was, um, digging some ground, it was hard work. Now it's hard work for a lad in his 20s, yet had to learn a man in his 50s um, to do this sort of graft and I was doing it. I was earning 80 pound a day, 80 quid a day, sometimes for a 12 hour day. Um, and it was hard work, but I had to do it. I had no option. The banks were, were on my back. They were coming around looking at repossessing my home because I couldn't pay my mortgage. I was relying on, on handouts, charitable handouts. And I thank everyone that put their hands in their pockets and helped me out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I was clearing a bit of ground in North London. And my phone was in my car. It was dark. Um, it was raining. And I was worn out. I went back to my car to retrieve something. I was removing a tree stump. So I wanted to finish the job off. It was a Saturday. Um, and I'd done a whole week of hard work and my phone had 50 missed calls and they were from my sister and, and one of my children and the messages were answer now where where the f are you and it was getting more and more abusive and it said uh tyler is in hospital now tyler was my second oldest son tyler's in hospital he's in a bad way he's broke his neck um my car was i don't know it, it wasn't far off the last stages of being empty and my son had been taken to Addensbrook Hospital bear in mind I was in North London taken to Addensbrook Hospital in Cambridgeshire um, and he was on a life-threatening um, situation his spinal column had been severed by 95 percent he was not expected to live he was to undergo 
um, immediate emergency surgery. He was still, for three days after his surgery, covered in mud um, from the accident where he ended up um, with a broken neck laying in a field covered in mud. He was still coming up for three days afterwards. Uh, they couldn't clean him up, they had no time. I was told that if the operation uh, takes 40 minutes, he'll live. If it takes more than that, he will surely die. I managed to, my car limped its way into the hospital. I was met there by my older boy who who come and started to attack me, screaming at me, where have you been? We've been trying to get, he just went mad at me, um, started thumping me. And, he's, and uh, he too was covered in mud where we'd been with his brother. Um, and um, I stayed there and my boy went away into surgery. Um, I didn't even have a chance to, to see him. It was probably the last time I was gonna see him. I drove home that night in order to wash and to be back um, for him. And as I got home, it was really strange. It was a, a quiet night, it was pitch black, but two in the morning and a star shot straight across the front of my car. Vroom, straight across. And I just knew my son had got through. I, I knew he'd, um, he'd made it. Um, I washed, I, I turned my car around to come back and my older son was at hospital and he said, uh, Dad, it's a success. Tyler's, um, you know, he, he's alive still. And um, I uh, got to the hospital and my boy was there and he was critically ill, and I mean critically ill for um, an, a number of months um, because his, his injury was so, it was on the, the very obtuse scale of that sort of injury. Um, they were amazed that he survived um, he couldn't breathe on his own because the nerve endings were just ripped to pieces. Um, and I informed a colleague that I work with what had happened. And I just said, look, you know what, I'm near near to the point of breaking. I was going up the hospital every day. I uh, couldn't afford sometimes to drive home. Uh, I become a blood donor in order that I would get a blood donor's badge which I could then stick in the um, front of my car and park in the blood donor's bay in the hospital because I couldn't even pay the parking fees and I wasn't going to park outside the hospital it was too far to walk in there I needed to be there um, I, I also as a blood donor could then go in and I would help them out and I would eat the free biscuits because I had no money something very strange happened I went in and they'd allowed my son um, they were going to put in a tracheotomy because he was on a ventilator machine for so long and they allowed him to take the the pipe out of his mouth for half an hour a day and I went in one day and his pipe was removed um, he is paralyzed he could move his um, I think this hand was the only move, body movement he had his, his right hand and as I went in he, he was screaming at me go home now dad go home now and I said, what's the matter? And I walked into this ICU. Everyone was on machines. There was, oh, it was a terrible place. Um, and he was saying, oh, can, can you not see them? I said, see what? He said, the witches, Dad, the witches. I said, what are you on about? And he said, the ceiling. He said, they've been waiting for you. They've been waiting for you all day. And he said, they're, they're circling around. He said, they're like in the films. They're like these witches and they are circling around. He said, Dad, they are spitting on you. They are urine, I'm using, this is, wasn't his terminology, you can imagine. They are urinating on you, they are defecating on you. They are being sick on you, you are covered in all their filth. They hate you for what you do. That was the exact words he said. Now this was strange because a very strong Christian friend of mine, a Polish lady, had a dream and she said to me, um, I keep dreaming John, these demons they keep saying, we hate you for what you do. Um, and it's the Jezebel spirit, the women. Um, I was never really to sort of put the two together, but my boy said the same. He said, they're women, they hate you for what you do. And it was late to find out the protection of children. And he said, just go, just go. He said, Dad, your, your phone is covered. Your phone's ruined now. My phone was all right, there was nothing wrong with it. And the consultant, um, surgeon was there and said he's been speaking stuff all day he's been saying some very profound things and he hadn't been speaking really up till this point so, so i said okay I'll, I'll go i'll go son he was clearly in distress he said please go dad well, i'm frightened they'll kill you and i left and as i left i got in the hospital looked 
and the whole screen of my phone had shattered. Don't know how. I went home, I got home. Um, I opened a bottle of beer. I had a bottle of beer and I remember ringing my mum, drinking this bottle of beer and as I did it, my home phone, my landline rang and it was uh, the consultant they said, get back to this hospital now, you need to get back now. I got in my car and I drove, bear in mind, not short of 100 miles, this, this horrible journey to Cambridgeshire. And when I get there, I met in the ICU by three consultants and they said, we're sorry, we've lost your son. Um, his heart stopped, his breathing stopped, his organs have all stopped. Um, we we spent just short of 10 minutes. Um, we timed it at seven and a half minutes, but there was a couple of minutes probably before that that we didn't notice him. Um, he'd gone into full cardiac arrest. Um, he is dead. He is dead. Um, they said we have him on full life support machine. Um, we will keep him on full life support machine um, for um, five days because they managed to get um, a bit of an algorithm back uh, and they managed to get a heart murmur back. He was being fully ventilated, full um, cardio um, assistance. Um, there was pipes and tubes everywhere and they said to me, their lawyer was there and they said, um, will you sign this form that after five days we will pull the plug. You can appeal it um, and then it'll be subject to an appeal and I said, no, 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 you're not my enemy. You've done everything you can to save my son. They said, John, we was, we was doing everything. We was three of us, three of us experienced consultants we got all the nurses out there was us surgeons we were on him for seven minutes he is bruised badly where they were doing everything they could anyway what i couldn't argue with that they did everything they could they were superb they were superb i went in and it was um a scene that no parent should really see you know their son just um helpless with every machine on there um this was at a point where i had no income point where I was looking at going to prison um, and basically losing my home where would my children go um, all from the Metropolitan Police and I'm calling them out disgusting at their commissioner level what they did because I exposed children as young as nine years old that were being used as sex slaves as prostitutes for all swathes of society from the bottom right up to the top now we shouldn't say the top because these aren't at the top these people are in the pit of hell pit of hell um, godless, godless people and being protected by commissioners that are also godless people um, and then attacking me for exposing this. I was there three days and I was going into the chapel. The chapel was a multi-faith chapel. There was a lot of Indonesian doctors there. They were praying in their corner to, to Allah. Um, there was a little Catholic, um, sorry, Catholic Christian altar there, and there was Bibles there, and there was Korans, and I was there praying with the um, Indonesian nurses and the Indonesian surgeons, one of which was a surgeon that, that, that helped save my child, and I would pray, and I remember reading a book of Matthew, and I re remember reading the Psalms and the uh, the Psalm, the Lords of My Shepherds, and, and just reading it, and I said to God, I said, God, what man am I if I cannot save my own son? You must give me my son back. And I told him, and people said you shouldn't bargain with God, but do you know what? This isn't the time for semantics. I told him, I said, you give me my son. I will not save anyone's child if I cannot save my own. You give me my son back. I am not a man if I cannot save my son. And that's that, my son is my life. All my children are my life. I will never ever leave my children, I will never forsake them, and if they die, I die too. And, and no man should ever bury their child, never. And um, and I went back and I said, I will not help anyone else's children if you do not allow me to help my child. And I went back, and do you know what? He woke up. My son woke up. He opened his eyes, and I said, now you move your toes. He moved the toes on his right foot. He had paralysis, body paralysis. He moved the toes on his left foot. He squeezed my hand with his right hand. He squeezed it. And with his left hand, it was this real limp-wristed attempt to squeeze. And then with that, I told him, I love you, son. 
and he murmured the same words back to me. And I looked at the, the nurse and I said, I'm going home. She said, well, what do you mean you're going home? I said, I'm going home. And I went home. And I went home um, to what I thought would be my children waiting for me. I went home to two police detectives dispatched from the Metropolitan Police under under the authority of the Commissioner Cressida Dick sent these two detectives to arrest me for child abandonment at a point when I couldn't have been stamped any lower. I was then arrested and cautioned for leaving my 15 year old son home alone with my 26 year old son I must add home alone whilst I was by my dying son's side. I was then um, arrested for child abandonment which which went nowhere it dissolved um, as quick as it came but something changed in me at that point um, something unbelievable changed in me it, it actually as much as my son had come back from the dead I came back from the dead I wasn't going to allow this anymore I had a choice at that point I could go under or I could fight back and I fought back there was no one could hurt me as much as I'd just been hurt no one Physically, no one could do anything to me. Um, I nearly lost my son and, and I, nothing would ever, ever hurt me like that ever again. Um, I get accused sometimes of being a bit cold hearted, but you know, I I know what pain is, you know, uh, and, I, and, I, and I do. Um, but things started to change at that point. Um, and it did, I took control and I took authority and I took the police on and I did. And I had my son back, so now it was time to get other children back. And I started to fight back. And I fought, fought back with a tenacity of, of a raging lion with a toothache, and I did. And I really took the fight to them. And, uh, and I think they would learn to regret ever covering this up. And the strange thing is, my son, that couldn't even, his lungs couldn't even function. Anything from these upper vertebrae down just wasn't functioning. He went on to walk out of the hospital and uh, a consultant, an Australian lovely woman turned around to me and she said, every now and then in our medical career things happen and we call it miraculous recoveries. She said, they don't like talking about them but they exist. She said, just as much as they don't like talking about near death experiences. The, the medical profession is hugely atheistic despite the insurmountable evidence of people dying and coming back, they still refuse. These are intelligent people, people that are articulate, that, that, are, that are learned. How stupid can they be? You know, and really we shouldn't really be taking any guide from some of these people that don't believe in, in that there is a life after. Um, you can't because it's just fundamentally flawed. And she said his, his recovery has gone down to a miraculous recovery he is living proof that miracles do happen so no one will ever ever take me away from the presence of god never never it happened in front of my own eyes and also later on he was to tell me we sat down he went on to have a child um to get engaged and to live an independent life it's phenomenal this was a boy that you know, he couldn't even go to the toilet for himself went on to do that incredible and he, he was sit to sit down with me um, at a later stage and say to me, Dad, you remember when we was in hospital and those things I said to you? And I went, yeah. He said, they were real, Dad. It wasn't drugs. Because um, they have a thing called um, psychosis that occurs when people have been anaesthetized for long periods of time, right? And it, and it causes um, d delusions in the mind. It causes people, look, if, if tramadol does it, things like that, if you're on it for a long time, your mind, the same as alcohol, you know, your mind starts playing a mop, but it's got a shelf life, it lasts for two to three hours and it goes because the body cleans up. My boy was in this state for 24 hours, it had long gone past the, the state of delirium, it's the word delirium, got long gone past the state of, of um, chemical delirium. He said they were there dad and they really hated you. Um, so uh, at that point, uh, the two worlds have been bridged, you know, um, and I realised that these things are out there. They were out there. And my faith was to be consolidated even further by um, being confronted by someone who was very close to me and that was helping me. Um, but someone I was later to find out that um, 
had been wronged. This woman had been wronged by her husband and um, she turned around and she said that sometimes Jesus doesn't listen, you have to go elsewhere. And what had actually happened is um, she'd been praying to the devil for um, retribution against her ex-husband. Uh, her father had offered her up to Satan as a child and had gone on to become a very, very wealthy man. She had a very privileged lifestyle and she had to come into my life um, to help me. She said she loved me. I genuinely believe she, she did. Um, but she was heavily demonised. And when I turned my back on her, um, I saw for the first time, really, the manifestation of possession. This woman's eyes went black. She hissed like a snake. Her tongue was pushed out like a proboscis. And, and she was spouting profanities in my face and spitting at me. And this voice that come out was like three voices at the same time speaking in, in, in concert with each other. But it was like it was um, supernaturally amplified, um, if that can be the word. It was like it had gone through some sort of um, voice distorting machine and was, was being amplified. And and it, when she spoke, it was spoken the plural, and she was saying in a male voice that um, that they had come to help me, they had protected me, that they um, were the ones that made sure I wasn't hurt or killed, because I was treading a very fine line. It had been mentioned to me by members of both the American and the British intelligence services that I, I stand the chance of assassination if I continue doing what I'm doing, credible, credible threats. Um, and this voice said, no, we protected you, we've been protecting you all the, all the way along. You must join us, John, and you will get continued protection and you will be triumphant. Um, but it wasn't right, it was wrong. It was, the woman's eyes were black and, and she was clearly, clearly demonized. And I said, that's okay but my protection comes from my Lord, my Master, Jesus Christ. And with that, that was like throwing water onto a hot chip pan. You know, the barrage of abuse I got then, F Jesus, F Jesus, F Jesus. Um, and it continued. And then I took authority in the name of Jesus Christ. I turned around and said, you have no power or dominion over this woman. Her soul belongs to Jesus. And that inflamed it even more. And then I asked who this person was, what this thing was, what is your name? You tell me your name in the name of Jesus Christ. And then this name come out that spouted out and it spouted this name, we are Marla, in this strange voice. And I said, you leave this woman, you have no governance over her, no authority over her. And with that, I then just started saying the Lord's Prayer and saying, the Lord is my shepherd. As, because I've been reading it whilst my son was in hospital. And the strange thing happened then. This voice then said to me, screamed at me, we hate you for what you do. And this is a third time I've heard this now, all within a demonic setting, as it were. Not the first one, that was a revelation that come through from a very Christian person. But the next one was from what my son had seen and then they said exactly the same thing. And with that, I just prayed. I just prayed and I said, Jesus, stand in front of me. Protect me, stand behind me, stand to the side of me. And with that, she fell to the floor and she passed out. And then within a minute, she woke up as if nothing happened, as if nothing happened. Um, so then I knew the power of Jesus Christ and for me, it's all about God, but for me, Jesus become like my stepdad was to me. It sounds strange because my stepdad did a lot of bad things, but Jesus become this power, you know, powerhouse, this unbelievable strength that I knew I could rely on. I knew that it, it would, everything I did, if Jesus was done, if I called on Jesus, and I would feel strong. I was asked to to attend a venue for for surveillance purposes in um in a forest just outside of London and we turned up and it was Halloween it was very weird because they'd placed in a churchyard all these jack o lanterns those pumpkins that they carve out you know in a churchyard which seemed a bit of a paradox a bit of an oxymoron why would you do that 
putting the supernatural within the Christian environment. And as we approach this church to, to wreck it, you know, in the depths of the night, um, I become very ill and I become quite sick. And my hands, and I said to the guy, please film this, my hands were covered in this like candy floss, white candy floss. And as I moved it, it was like heavy, it was dripping off my hands. And it was all over my hands. And he went to get the camera and the battery had been drained from the camera. The torches then went off because they were drained. And this stuff was just, and it was, I was becoming more and more sick. Um, he prayed with me and we walked out of this area of this church and I, I was okay again and this stuff had just dissolved. It was thick and it was like these big mittens of this bizarre candy floss type white gloop all over my hands. It was the strangest thing. And this guy said, John, you need, you need to um, be born again. You need um, to be baptized. And I said, but I've been baptized. I've, I've, I've been, I was a Catholic. He went, no, John, you need it. And also my Christian friends would would keep saying it to me, keep saying it to me, you need to be baptized. And the feeling of sickness I got, it clearly I was open to an attack. As I progressed through this path to expose the evil that is child abuse, child prostitution, as I was later to find out child murder, because to start with, predominantly, I was dealing with, with allegations of, of child prostitution as an independent, because I'd now left the police. I'd fought them, I took them on, I secured my pension, and I won triumph after triumph against these people. And then I started working with what were really well, were ex-criminals. Um, one was a former gangster and a man who, who did time for a very, very high profile organized crime hit, murder, whatever you call it, that, that becomes synonymous with the underworld in um, in the UK. The death of a guy called Jack the Hat McVitie and, and the murder linked to these two um, despicable individuals called the Cray Twins. Their henchman, their hard man, whatever, um, a man called Chris Lambriano, he went away for um, 17 years in prison for the murder of this guy. Chris Lambriano went away with his brother Tony and uh, say that they're, they're iconic in the underworld. Um, I sort of got drawn towards Chris. The main thing was Chris had, had given his testimony and it was um, the day that changed my life. And it's Chris, a big hard man, talking about his time in a category A prison, the top tier high security prison and he was looking in a mirror and as he looked in the mirror, he was a man of anger, a man of excess, a man of pure selfishness, really, because it was what he wanted to do in life. He did it no matter what. And a man that got involved then with, with a murder, although he didn't do the murder, uh, he was an accessory to the fact. He looked in the mirror and he said he saw the devil. And I asked him, what did the devil look like? He said, John, the devil was me. I was the devil. He saw the devil looking back at him. And he does this in a, in a tremendous um, um, Netflix testimony, which I watched and it had a very profound effect on me. Because as a guy's talking, you can feel the decency and compassion in this man. You could feel it. You knew he was a changed man. You knew it. Um, he then went on his journey to Jesus, which he said was the hardest, the hardest journey he's ever been on in life because he had to face himself. He had to repent every bit of bad that he'd done and he said that is the hardest thing people cannot face themselves they can point at others and do good but they cannot look inside and change they can't do it but those that do he said it really, really you've got to then purge yourself and realize you've been bad i get a lot of people say to me i'm clean i'm pure let me tell you no one's clean and no one is pure and he then had the bible um he wanted to move away from the Bible. He said, you know, he's reading lists of all sorts, even porno mags. But he said the Bible just kept staying there. But the more he went to the Bible, the more he would hear voices in his head telling him to kill himself. You're worthless, kill yourself, kill yourself. Over a consecutive period of days, he kept hearing the same thing. Time for you to go, you have no use. You've ruined your family, you've ruined this. 
die, you must die, you must die. Now at that point I realised what my friend must have heard when my friend killed himself. In the police I had, I've had two people, one very profound experience, but um, two people kill themselves. One guy killed himself in front of me, um, right in front of my face, and I spent an hour then doing uh, recess. I was covered in his blood for an hour, just me and him. I was the only one that could get to his broken body. And uh, this guy tried to kill me, tried to take me with him at the top of a block of flats, tried to jump off, tried to pull me. Um, he didn't, but as he, as he jumped, he looked at me, he smiled and he waved. And it was like something was beckoning him, calling him, like something was dragging him, something was welcoming him. And this is what the devil does, this deception, this theft of life. And, um, and I've seen it in front of me, you know. And um, Chris said, no matter how loud this voice was, because it was loud, he said, at the very, very recesses of his consciousness, he heard this soft voice saying, I love you, I love you. And he knew that was Jesus. And, and, and so um, ashamed was his journey to Jesus, he hid his Bible in his pants so no one would know he was reading it. And now he, he openly proclaims the word of Jesus. Now openly, but he said, never hide your religion, never hide your religion, sorry, your belief. Let me not mention that word again. And so Chris gave this thing and I was drawn to this man and I ended up meeting up with Chris and it was then to to be the the start of a really phenomenal um, friendship and um, I call him my uncle this guy and you can just feel the good in him and this guy goes into prisons and speaks about his experience because it's, it's his experience that took him there it's his experience and his journey that people want to hear because they can then follow him on that next journey into Jesus and it's the same with me it's important I talk about what I went through because it's what made me what I am now. And it, it consolidates who Jesus is and what Jesus is. And this is not about religion, let me tell you that. Um, so I went on to raise a lot of money through Chris um, and we've become very, very close friends. But that was just the start of it. Through there, I was then to work with a guy called Bill Maloney. Lovely, lovely man. A man that was on the street from the age of 12, from abuse and from everything. He um, had a terrible life, a hard man. And Bill and myself become like brothers. And uh, Bill invited me into his flat. And as I went in there, the one thing that struck me was uh, Bill, in one of his down times, because a lot of people that have been abused, they suffer such tremendous depression, such awful bouts of depression, which will trigger alcoholism and everything. These demons will always try and drag them back. In there, he's got this hand-drawn picture um, that he's, and it's of a real tough guy, but it's Jesus. And he's drawn it on his wall. And it just makes me laugh. On the wall of his house, he's got Jesus, and Jesus is like, like a man, a street, like Charles Bronson, you know, in um, Death Wish, that sort of build. And he said to me, see that guy, Johnny? He said, he wasn't no sandal-wearing idiot social worker. That was the toughest guy that ever walked this planet. That man is a proper hard man. Let me tell you that. And again, Jesus, 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 this consistency. I was then to watch another testimony, very similar to Chris Lambriano's, and it's of a guy called Brian Knox. Brian, again, a tough guy from, from the Scottish crime scene, and almost a blueprint of, of, of his journey towards Jesus as Chris Lambriano's, and parts of Bill Maloney's. And um, I was then at a very low ebb when I really, this is the beginning of the year when I really started to want to push this forward, I got attacked. And then I was then to experience something that was um, profoundly, um, I don't know, cut in for me, profoundly uh, changed me, was I nearly lost another one of my children in very, very tragic circumstances. Um, it was, um, I won't go into it, um, but one of my children, I nearly lost him. I will leave it at that. Um, and that pushed me to a point where I hid. I hid in a corner of the recesses of my room for days on end. I was medicating myself with strong painkillers because I didn't want to even move. I didn't want to go anywhere. 
you know, I, I, if he dies, I was dying as well. And this was when the attack really came. And then after watching this testimony of this man, Brian Knox, I received a phone call and it was Brian Knox. And Brian told me to put my shoes on and go for a walk. So I did, I got out of the house and then Brian started telling me about his life and what was going on with my son, he can equate to what was been going on within his family and his life and it lifted me. Just that bit, it lifted me. And then each day Brian rang me up again and it lifted me again and again. And then he started telling me about his path to Jesus. And then he invited me down to his church. And I went down to his church and I was used to these Catholic churches. These repressive Catholic churches with this white noise and this staid attitude. You know, this disciplined environment. Typically, I, I'd say British, but it's across the globe. And I was to go to this church where there were people that were singing. There was um, a joyous at atmosphere. And, and, and Brian was, I never met Brian before. And I went up there and I recognized Brian from the video and Brian got up and, and gave a talk. And then this pastor, this Jamaican guy got up and he started talking about the devil. And now we must fight against the snares of the devil. Now you don't get that in these Christian churches. They don't even mention the devil. And afterwards, I was told to stay behind, and then a group prayed with me. And then this pastor come up to me and said, I know who you are, John. I know who you are, and I know the journey you're going on. But let me tell you something. In the spiritual realm, you are a rabbit being torn apart by foxes, angry foxes. And unless you get protection, they will tear you apart. And they have been tearing you apart. Well, he was right. Of course they've been tearing me apart. I've nearly lost two of my children since I've been going on this journey. So anyone, anyone who says that, that people that go to Christ, it's going to be easy and it's going to be all sunshine and oranges. How wrong are you? You will get attacked and I don't want to put no one off because this is how the devil works. But I would rather stand up as a day fight and as a lion than live a lifetime as a lamb under, under the, 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 the guise and the control of the devil it ain't happening i will i will stand up and be counted and i will and i come this far and i continue we started to build a community around um this um foundation the john wedger foundation wanting people to come out and speak out because the devil works in in the covert in the shadows in the secrets always a secret secret secrets all the time we got to get rid of the secrets and we got rid of get rid of the shame and the guilt. And I started asking people to come forward and speak out and I will record their testimonies. And I started recording testimonies, victims and survivors of them of awful abuse. The vilest, vilest perversion. And these people were prepared to do it because they had to say no more. They didn't want any more children hurt. And they started coming forward and I started getting this recognition and this audience and it built bigger and bigger and then people started coming into my life um, like Christine who then um, wanted to really sort of give me a bit of employment doing maintenance work but really what had happened is that Christine said I've been drawn to help you and from Christine a church got set up and Christine then was introduced to Brian um, and many others come forward and started setting up this, this church, this prayer group. Um, more and more people coming forward, but what happened was people started coming forward that had been abused in a ritualistic environment. And this is really was my baptism in, into what was to come the fight against satanic ritual abuse. Something that was always taboo, always hidden was never looked at in its entirety by the authorities, never looked at by the police, never. They were aware of it, but every time anyone started looking into it from the police and or the political forum, they were shut down, and sometimes they were killed. Um, and they started coming slowly, the victims of SRA, and then they came more and more and more and more, and in the end, it, it was then taken up 80% of, of my interviews was to do with satanic ritual abuse. Um, and it got to a point then that I really, really needed protection, and I did. Um, and so um, there was 
uh, a very profound um, experience. I had a, a dream in which I was being choked and strangled and I was being crushed and I was held by the throat and I was dying and I, I was actually dying um, and I managed to sort of get myself to and I woke up and I thought I'm, I'm dead I'm, I'm a dead man here and uh, anyway I woke up and I managed to get to the bathroom and I, I brushed my teeth washed, washed my face and this voice was there and his voice said I love you you need deliverance you need to deliver yourself and I sank to my knees and I prayed and I prayed and this was about five in the morning and I had to go to work and I got up about half six to leave for work and there was police outside my house and it cordoned off it was a crime scene and there was a guy very similar appearance to me and he died he choked to death and died outside the back of my house um, and then I realized that this threat was real and it was really real so what happened then was that our little gang as it were our gang of warriors for Christ um, got together and I was invited down to a beautiful part of the world down to Bexhill and Sea and um, Brian had organized my baptism I was baptized as a child under the uh, auspice of the the Catholic Church but I always thought that was good enough but how wrong was I how wrong was I so I was um, taken in to see it was uh, a particularly calm day and um, it was flat the water was flat and we went in there and Brian came in with, with an ex, a former ex paratrooper uh, and part of our team a guy called Martin and as we got in all of a sudden this storm whipped up and the waves started coming in they came out of nowhere and uh, that was the time to go under that was the last little protest that the devil always has and uh, I was shoved under you know under I went and up I come again and uh, that was the start of a new chapter I heard the Bible and a lot most people would read bits from the Bible and really I mean, what, what, what when, when lads read the Bible, they just read Book of Revelations, because it's like reading a script from a Hollywood film, isn't it, the Book of Revelations? Um, the only other time I read was the Book of Matthew, when my son, and the Book of Psalms, when my son was, um, was dying. There's so much in the Bible, and it's so bulky, and it can be difficult to really grasp. But it was Brian that, that started, um, he said, have you got um, a King James Bible and I had I was given one at my first Holy Communion as a little kid back in the early 1970s and Brian got me to um, as, as I would walk out of the house I wouldn't do anything in the house because I'd go out and walk my quiet time was outside Brian would be on the phone with me and would be reading the Bible and then Brian would stop and he would explain it and he started to explain what it really meant and, and what the power is in a word and every word matters and any distortion of a word a was that could become a when will totally distort it you know a must be a may and things like that and it will totally will change you know the gravity of what's being said so therefore every word must be accepted in its entirety because it has a place in this huge jigsaw I was invited to um, to go to a Bible class down in Eastbourne and as we walked in there was a guy that, that, that met me and uh, funny enough that day been watching one of my videos and uh, went, oh my word please come in come in and it was then really that I was tutored for the first time on what the Bible meant I, you know we'd had it at school but they never really explained it it was done in a repressive way but this was you know explaining that this is a manual for life this is there to protect us this isn't there to repress us and put us down. This is there to explain to us the, the monumental task we've got in front of us. You know, what the Bible does is unpick this, this tangled ball and it shows you the way. And it shows you how it also tells you how people came uh, into the world and, and took on this fight, this ancient fight. And this is a Babylonian, Sumerian ancient battle. This is pre-flood this, you know. And also shows how some of these institutions, maybe a lot of these religious institutions, all they're doing is re revisiting paganism and revisiting these ancient satanic cults. They haven't changed. All they've done is just morphed. Um, so 
that was really what Brian did. He'd become uh, a tutor and started guiding me and really making me wake up to the seriousness of, of, of what I face. And there's a warning in all of this, and this warning is, you know, you, you shape up, otherwise you're out of here. You know, you're gone. But, you know, you're needed for this fight, is what he said, and needed for this fight. So, um, this is what I've been doing, you know, and, and really, and also cleaning up my act. Cleaning up my act. Now I do fall by the wayside, you know. I had, I struggled for years with, with borderline alcoholism. Because you've got to understand that alcohol is a powerful, powerful tool. It's a, it's a friend at times. It's an anaesthetic. It's a counsellor. It's this, but ultimately, it's incredibly destructive. Um, and as the people choose, you know, people have this argument. Oh, you know, cannabis is better than alcohol. No, they're not. They're no, none of them are any good. Um, so I, I had to sort of start coming to terms with, you know, where I've been failing. And one of the main things was anger. I was angry, and I was angry to my children, you know. And uh, Brian said, watch watch your words, because your word is just a, a mix up of the word sword. It will cut and it will hurt. And I was scathing to my children. I would denigrate them with my words. You know, I would call them retarded and idiots and stupid and gay and all sorts of words, and I would do. And I would do out of anger, out of frustration, out of all sorts, out of being tired. You know, I'd, I'd worked so hard, and I brought up four kids on my own, and I kept everything together, and I'd, and I'd been up against adversity, and so I was angry, and I was, I was spiteful at times, and I had a problem with authority, and I had a problem with the world, and, uh, and I would take it out on my children, and I would, I never hit them, I'm not into that, but I would, I would make them hide in the corners with, with my spiteful words, so I, I had to, I had to look at myself and. Then the pain come of what I'd done. And then the realisation that I could have lost two of my children. And I still couldn't lose other children. And I could have lost my children and they would have gone to their graves with th this sorrow that their dad had called them all these words and everything else. And I didn't want that. And I didn't want that. You know, and I wanted to be as good a man as I could. And I could. And, and the realisation that I'm still a man and I will still make mistakes. But, um, I just needed to clean up, but you know, I want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone. But really, I want to say a big thank you to Brian Knox. Started off with a guy called Douglas Riggs, who rang me up when I was around with Christine one day. And Christine would always, always go on about the, the power of prayer, the power of prayer. And Doug Riggs, a guy from America, a well known preacher, rang me up and put me on to Brian. And then Brian was there at this very, very low time and really sort of push me really and only the language I would understand which is quite a sort of forceful macho voice a bit like how my stepfather used to talk to me get up and deal with it because I had a bit of problem with authority and had a problem with really women telling me what to do as well um still probably have to be honest and think about it but I mean but but I did listen I did listen it you know um but it's still a long journey still got a long way to go what am I doing now and, and how God is using me, well, I mean, this is something which is morphing and changing by the day. My mission statement, and I hate using these corporate terms, mission statement, and that annoys me um, because everything's fluid, I just don't like it. But I mean, my mission statement initially was to give the voiceless a voice, to be the platform in which victims and survivors of abuse can speak out because like I said, the uh, the devil works in a the covert. They love everything hidden and secret. We have this government that slaps secrecy laws on, on anyone who's speaking out. People that are speaking out against Satanism um, and the involvement of politicians in organized paedophilia and, and, and child prostitution, which is a form of Satanism, they're hit with things called a D notice. Now, now, people that um, are foreign to the UK might not, not understand what a D notice is. A D notice is a defence notice. It was implemented at the beginning of the First World War by naval, Royal Naval Intelligence. It's a military intelligence tool. Our military intelligence services are the MI departments, MI1 to 6. MI5 is for homeland terrorism. MI6 is for um, overseas espionage and detection. MI6 serve D notices on anyone who speaks out against um, 
the involvement of establishment people and Satanism. So this shows how deep this goes in the UK. Um, but there are ways around this. We have very strong liable laws. The, the US doesn't have liable laws. We have them. Very powerful and they can shut us down in an instant and imprison us. So I tell people, you know, be careful about naming names, but we don't have to name names. Just speak about what's gone on and the locations. So this is what you're doing. It's a witness project. It's giving people the ability to be witnessed, to speak out. It's got to such a degree that was getting almost a million followers a month on social media. Social media is a platform. Now, you can't just rinse people of, of their testimonies and just leave them standing because you're opening up a wound. There's a rawness and there's a spiritual rawness. You know, people have purged themselves and have spoken out and they've opened up their heart, which is so hard for anyone to do. And there's a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. So there needs to be some sort of aftercare. Now, we can't please everyone, as we found out um, in, in recent weeks. Um, we have had um, some, some issues, but um, there are others that, that need help. And therefore, there is guidance there. And this is where Christine and Brian and, and um, Dora and Evelina and the others come in, where they will give uh, prayer protection they will provide prayer when when we go out we, we were setting up a proactive field intelligence group formulated what i'm going to say tough guys like jesus we're getting a lot of ex-military guys wanting to help they've had enough of this injustice we've got guys with a background in close protection coming forward you know and uh, and the believers in christ and going out um and and following up the information that has been provided um, going out and doing field intelligence on sites that have been used for satanic worship and hopefully we'll be putting together a proactive operation to try and curtail this evil practice whether that means disrupting a ceremony who knows we, we get to see but it's the the police have got no interest in doing this the politicians have got no interest the press have got no interest so we're leaving it up to us, you know, um, to do it. And we're doing it all under common law. And we will work within the parameters of the law. But we need to make society wake up. We need to open our eyes um, to what's going on. Let me tell you something about child prostitution. People have a problem with that term. Um, this is not a seminar in semantics here. This is, this is a preaching of reality here. Child prostitution, right? They've gone about the three monkeys. Don't know, they see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. You know that thing? If you shut your ears to child prostitution, you don't hear it. If you close your eyes in middle England, middle class, white, comfortable middle England, you won't see it. And if you won't speak out against it, or you silence those that want to speak out, you won't hear it either. Right? But does that mean it goes away? No, it doesn't. We need to wake up the comfortable and make them feel a bit uncomfortable. Now, that might sound a bit spiteful, but I'm not here, let me tell you this, I'm not here to placate an adult. I'm here to protect children from the evil that is satanic ritual abuse and abuse. Any abuse is satanic. And that's what I'm here for. So if people get the hump with my terminology that, that sometimes airs on the vernacular, and sometimes when I become graphic about the abuse that these kids have endured, the damaged sphincter muscles, the torn colons, the misaligned wombs, the infectious diseases which, which are gathered in the genitalia. Do you know what, I don't care. I don't care. Be uncomfortable. But really, your discomfort and my fear is a drop in the ocean compared to their discomfort and their fear. There is no greater fear that I will ever encounter than that of a child that is in the middle of the night having the blanket pulled from over them by their abuser. Let me tell you that. So if we, we blank this out and we don't want to hear it, then, then we're condemning the next generation of kids to abuse and to the destruction of their souls. So our job is to get out there and reclaim these souls that the devil has taken. That's our job. And we are winning. And we are winning. And people say, but we don't read about it in the press. Well, since when did anyone 
anyone believe what the press said you know there's a saying that's as old as the press itself the only thing you can believe is the date so why all of a sudden do they believe it now when they never believed it before just because the mainstream media do not publicize it the mainstream media do not publicize it because they're covering up for it and if you cover up for this you are complicit in this abuse you are complicit in this abuse if you turn your back on this you are as bad as the abuser you know if you see it happening in the garden next to you and you say nothing, you are as bad. Now is not the time to do nothing. There is no fence, so get off it. Right? You're either with on our side, that of Jesus doing the right work, or you're on their side, helping the abuser. There is no middle ground here. Do not be lukewarm. Satanic ritual abuse. What is it? Well, my word, what, what, what a... Uh, what a question, what a loaded question. The strange thing about satanic ritual abuse is a consistency in it. You know, um, this occurs all over the planet and what they subject, um, I'm really mainly gonna focus on the children but this does expand to, to, to adults, um, is um, how uniform the abuse is. It's abuse of children, you know, physical, mental and sexual abuse. Uh, the one thing that um, legislation doesn't sort of go on about is spiritual abuse, which is really the uh, the mainstay of it, of, of the children um, and the organized element to it. And it actually um, made the media, uh, it made the television and it, and it formulated part of the training manual for um, the Child Abuse Investigators Handbook and was used then as the doctrine to um, educate police officers, um, social workers, hospital staff and multi-agency staff. So they are aware of it. Satanic ritual abuse has, has been classed as a cult. Um, it is against the code of conduct for police officers to have any involvement with a cult or a political party. So policemen shouldn't be involved in satanic ritual abuse. At present it's not seen as a religion. They want it seen as a religion but um, Again, in order to do so, they would then have to sort of um, uh, publish, you know, their their operating practices, their codes of conduct, you know, and everything else, which um, I don't think they really want to do. Um, especially when the reality of, of SRA gets out there. So, really, what is it? Well, it, it's, it's devil worship. It's the, the opposing um, force to to Christianity really you know um, we worship God uh, we worship life and um, they they would say that they worship life but they don't um, they're, they're malevolent and they worship their deity which is Lucifer Satan and in doing so sacrifices are made and uh, no greater sacrifice than that of a child and it's not just a sacrifice of a child it's also the torture of a child it's a depravity it's a sex with children um, the, uh, the Holy Communion that's seen within the, 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 the Christian um, remit, you know, again, that is um, replicated in theirs where they will make the host out of um, uh, defecate, out of urine, out of menstrual blood, out of um, semen and, and, and various other sort of bodily excretions. You know, um, homeless people have been uh, used um, there's this Darwinian element to it where only the strong survive, so weak members of community are just seen as fodder. Animals um, are regularly used, the torture and the sacrifice of animals. Um, they will occupy places of, of sort of ancient interest, pagan sites, the ley lines, things like that. There's symbolism we can see all over the place. Once you are an initiate into these practices, you will start to recognise not only the symbolism, but also those that are involved and, and things they say. Again, you get that with secret societies. They will drop little words in and, and things like that where you can identify them. So more and more people have come forward and they start telling the same stories. And these stories are that this is intergenerational. Their parents are in on it. They are abused sexually from the earliest of ages. Um, so they are raped and they are sodomised. Um, they are then um, urinated on, um, defecated on, they are beaten, they are electrocuted, they are drowned. Drowning seems to be a very big thing. 
they are then taken usually around the age of three to start actively taken to ritual so that already they are, are well indoctrinated um, into sort of sexual and um, physical and emotional abuse so it becomes a norm they're then taken to rituals these rituals um, people say sometimes they are Masonic lodges I've heard of um, the Royal British Legion which is like a benevolent uh, sort of um, ex-forces charity the Salvation Army um, again which is a Christian sort of uh, organisation that's meant to help they, these places we mentioned police stations military bases occur a lot and they do they're quite disproportionate the military bases and they're taken and um, also farm buildings and where you know they are put in this sort of um, churchy type environment but churches again are used and there's like a high priestess and there's a lot of singing a lot of swaying uh, chanting the summons summons in of, of the demons the devil and then there is sacrifices animals are sacrificed children are sacrificed runaways are sacrificed there are women that are used as breeders to produce babies for these sacrifices um, the uh, children are used to kill other children so if there is a baby up for um, sacrifice, another child will be used. One woman told me how she, they, they um, taped heavily, uh, gaffer taped, uh, like a long knitting needle. And she was then made to um, put it in and out of a, of a very young infant, month old um, baby girl into the vagina area of the girl to kill it. Um, the girl was then cut open and the blood was drank by everyone everyone there so there was no one there just because they wanted to have a look and see if it was for them there was none of that everyone was involved um, another woman was telling me how they'd uh, cut open a young boy and she was then told to bite the beating heart of an infant boy and she said that just um, uh, gave everyone power that she said it was like a wave of electricity sweeping through so there is this deity worship in it which is something that that the, the British system um, refuses to acknowledge that this is deity worship. And they, oh, they, oh, they try and trivialise it, say that it's paganism, say that it's white witchcraft or even black witchcraft, but they don't kill any, anything. They just believe in nature and things like that. But it's just a front for what really is going on. Uh, incredibly well connected. Um, there was a list, and I implore everyone to look at this list. It's called the Rains List. And it's an acronym, R-A-I-N-S, Ritual Abuse Information Network Support. And it was compiled by a very prominent and well-respected in a field, Doctor of Psychology and Psychotherapy, Dr Joan Coleman, based in the uh, King's College Hospital in London, where she was therapising victims of abuse. And she was taken back by how many of them were mentioning satanic abuse, so much so that she started to collate the information. These people started then mentioning names, places and events. And if more than two, so more than two independents, or a minimum of three now, independent people mentioned the same place, the same person, the same event, she would then record it. And she said then they had some sort of um, liable justification for doing it. And this list got published. Now there is a bigger extended list um, where one person might have mentioned it or just two people mentioned it. But this is belt, braces and string with, with more than two, so th minimum of three people. And it names politicians, leading UK politicians. It names actors, international singers, musicians, clergymen. There was even my old boss of Scotland Yard who was in charge of the vice unit, a chief superintendent in charge of the vice unit. This man had governance for sex crime and for runaway children that possibly could be involved in, in the sex industry in London. This guy is on it. And bear in mind the testimonies that we take, we've taken, in which people say runaway children are the main prey for these vultures. Um, and this guy's on it. And not once was there ever an investigation, despite um, campaigning on our behalf, uh, that, that this gets looked into. And even when I did campaign to the Ombudsman uh, for police investigations, 
a public appointed body I was told that none of my allegations will ever be looked at I was I've got that in writing so this is how much they cover it up it's how widespread this is this is ancient deity worship this predates Christianity this goes back before the flood even you know this is Babylonian this is Baal worship Moloch whatever you want to call it, it is devil worship and we are seeing it trivialized in Disney films, in, in Hammer House of Horror films, in all sorts of dramatizations, you know, where they try and make the devil cuddly. But at the end of the day, um, this is alive and it is real and it damages the victims beyond compare. Those that do survive it, they have a thing which is known as DID, Disassociated Identity Disorder, multiple personalities. So if ever they do want to make um, criminal allegations against their abusers, well, who's going to listen to them? They're mad. They're mentally ill. No one's going to listen to them. They're disillusioned or they're schizophrenic. You've got um, prominent um, doctors of psychology that, that, you know, that give a public address and write papers on false memory syndrome in order to sort of debuff, debunk, and make sure that victims, true victims of satanic abuse are never heard. A lot of them end up with alcohol, drug, mental health problems. So again, they'll never be heard. And it is absolutely endemic in this country. And it is. And the other side issue that comes with this, and this is where this is so sad, that all European police agencies, bar the Dutch, have denied the existence of snuff movies. Snuff movies are films made of people being killed there are snuff movies made in satanic rituals and especially that the rape and then the murder of children because that's a special niche these things are worth a huge amount of money hence the reason organized criminals are involved you will have gangsters involved and again this this public perception that gangsters are modern day robin hoods no they're not no they are not right there will be senior police officers there will be politicians these people will act as gatekeepers preventing any information disseminating out to the public it is massively debunked in, in by all the media agencies and in public life so no one gets to really believe it it will always remain a myth and and actually a very very minor part of what goes on in this country if it ever does get out and those that do um speak out as, as officially as victims are then rubbished for being mentally ill as I've mentioned so snuff films by all criminal agencies national and federal agencies have denied their existence yet the information that we're getting is that these things constantly constantly crop up and they are made and they are used as a political lever um, they are used in order to manipulate um, those in power to toe the line and behave themselves there was this theory that um, if a politician was involved in, in satanic abuse or paedophilia that they would be filmed, it could be used for them to um, uh, to steer their policy making a certain way. I disagree. I think those in charge are involved in satanic abuse and not just these, these weak-minded ones. You know, these weak-minded ones, they, they are just used as a threat to say you will toe the line with us or you'll die, not to sort of um, cover it under the carpet. If if a politician puts his penis in a little boy's anus, it's appalling, it's disgusting, it's evil, but it is not gonna cause the political and the economic and the financial collapse of the United Kingdom. It is not. It will maybe dealt with, I don't know, swept under the carpet, words of advice given, whatever, right? Um, but it won't cause the collapse to the degree um, that they make out. So there is no need then for the military intelligence agencies, MI5 and MI6, right, to get involved. No need. However, if these politicians are active Satanists, right, which links into members of our hierarchy, our royal family, who have been mentioned... Um, the, the upper echelons of our political environment and they are all Satanists then that would cause a world revolution and there is every single need for them to have their friends in the police in the NHS, in the coroner's office in social services in every every bit of a popular life there is every need and it makes every sense 
Child porn is worth a lot of money. Drugs, they make out drugs are scourge of society. No, 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 no. No, right, right. Drugs you use once, a child you can use a thousand times and maybe more. They are a cash cow from cradle to grave, these children. And Satanism is the driving force behind all of this. And it really is. You know, I get attacked by Satanists every single minute of the day. Now, if you are proud, and I speak to Satanists, you are proud of what you do. You, you religiously follow your faith, right? To the point where you kill your own children. Then you stand up and publicly declare that. You allow us to come and film it. Okay, you tell the police what's going on and let's have a program on it and an open debate on it, but you won't do it. You won't do it because you know it is wrong. And you know that 99.9% .9 reoccurring of the population will be appalled and disgusted at what you do. But I would say that, that, that satanic ritual abuse is the single most detrimental thing that our society is facing, bar none. Bar none. Not drugs, not guns, not not the spread of contagions nothing it's satanic ritual abuse and it is a uniform and it is everywhere with satanic ritual abuse what can jesus do i mean well um jesus is working through us i know he's working through me i mean i never ever thought that this would be my battle um i was slowly drip fed into this you know with, with the children I know that, you know, it sounds a cliche, but the children are the future. We, we damage our children. We damage society. We, we stamp all over society. We dirty it. We defile it, you know, and we'll be forever picking up the pieces. Now, it's lunacy that this is allowed to happen. It's lunacy that our criminal justice system is all it's doing is picking low-hanging fruit. Um, that we are putting people in prison that are clearly, clearly in need of, of, of healing yet there is none and it all the only ones who benefit are the ones that abuse and the ones that make money out of this i.e I. the solicitors and everything else um and again maybe we need solicitors but if we didn't abuse kids now then we wouldn't need solicitors so how can some public sector workers like nurses work for a minimum wage at solicitors that they're working for 450 quid an hour it's it's obtuse and obscene in its own right but when people say to me it's and it's this is a tough call this is something that I did struggle to start with and and I say you know that God doesn't want this and they would say well where is God where was God there was two brothers that were um, from Belfast Catholic boys were put into a Catholic children's home the twin brothers they were dragged in a very young tender age the first night a priest sodomized both of them they were then taken to parties where priests would be reading the Bible and then would not only sodomize them and make them perform um, sex acts on these other priests, make these boys do it, they would then make these two priests sodomize each other, bugger each other, right? And um, this is what went on. And um, they could argue, well, where was God? Now, and what would these people then want to hear the Bible when they've had it screamed at them whilst they were being raped? Um, it's a tough call but what I say to them is the people who did this they were evil they were evil and they used the Bible and they, they hid beyond the name of Jesus you know in order to, to continue with their sick perversion and there will be a special place in hell for these people no two ways about it. anyone who hides behind the name of Jesus Christ to con commit unthinkable acts of children they are doomed they have had it and I would do you know what one day I'd like to be at, at the bedside of one of these vile satanic abusers and just experiencing that last moment of clarity on this earth what they see what they see facing them because i tell you what they are going to um be petrified you know when they know and i will say to these people you repent now and you put right what you put wrong because i tell you what it's better you do it in this world then you won't have a chance in the next you will not you will be sorry you know um jesus in my opinion is calling together an army, an army of people um, to say no more, to say no more. Ultimately, this war is won, Jesus wins. But we're living in a physical realm and we've got hands and we've got teeth and we've got feet and we've got brains and we need to use them. And we need to show the world what has gone on. And unless we do something about it, this will continue. 
it will carry on and children will continue to be hurt but people like myself who say not in our name not in the name of Jesus will this continue and and you know um, a few people have taken so many testimonies that they say that when they were being abused and they've said I wasn't alone and they talk about angels being with them you know they talk about a white light just engulfing them you know a lot of these children experienced death because they were tortured that bad they actually died and they did come back you know um, and one guy said to me you know when they were abusing me and they locked him in a cupboard um, he died and he said he Jesus was there Jesus came and uh, said you just call on me just call on me and he showed them his abusers and he said you know what John when I saw them I saw how weak and pathetic they are they are weak they have to do everything in the covert they have to pick on children I mean this is bullying even in, in its, its minorous level this is bullying grown people picking on children and then raping the children and again this is it's and then they get heavily influenced and heavily demonized their life is not their own their souls are gone their minds are gone they've totally and utterly sold out they are not in control of what they do you know and um god is always there he always has been there and it is a tricky one for those that are heavily traumatized I, i'm with them and i can see why people have turned their back um on god i can see it i can see it and it is it is a tricky one but Jesus is always there. This wasn't Jesus who did this. This wasn't God that did this. This was the devil that did this. You know. And um, there are some people that give some tremendous accounts. I mean there is a lady. And she won't mind me naming her. Her name is Vicky Ash. Victoria Ash. A-S-H. Uh, she's a victim survivor of the most appalling satanic abuse. And she's one of now the main campaigners against it. She knows in her heart, in her lifetime, that will be exposed. Her father was a very prominent member of society in a very ancient part of the UK, and there are all sorts of abused in, 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 we were used in the abuse of her. And she has gone over to Jesus, and what a powerful woman. And it was through her and her testimonies, many others have come forward. So much so that um, because of her testimony, I did a testimony with her, another one has come forward who totally corroborates her story to the point where even the venues are, are tying in and the abusers look like they're identical so it's a massive step forward we need to get the authorities to do the right thing if they don't then we know what side they're on you know but we are getting there we need to shame these people we really do need to shame them you know and uh, I'm, I'm for waging war against them because I think it's, it's the only way we're going to do it but in, a, in the right way in a right, righteous and spiritual way because this is spiritual warfare no two ways about this this is a battle within the unseen realms you know and this is where we are and, and God has he's got this he's got this but unfortunately there is freedom of choice and these people have chosen to worship these fallen angels these ancient these Nephilim whatever you might term them they are demonic these are the remnants from the great flood of whatever they might be and they are roaming around just waiting to pounce into us at every opportune moment but they have no dominion if we have Jesus there you know and I tell people that Jesus and it's, it's about really not selling Jesus he doesn't need to do that but through our actions they will see us by our deeds will they know us and we will go out there and we will do good and they will know who we are and um but I'm 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 on the winning side. I know I'm on the winning side, without a doubt. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy battle. Of course it isn't. And and like so many of us have suffered, so many of us, some more than others. Um, but we do it. So no more will these children suffer. No more. On a parting note, you know our campaign is forever moving forward, and this is what we're doing. This you know is an uphill struggle, but we are getting there. And I speak out to the victims and survivors of this abuse and say the shame and the guilt is not yours to hold. Give it up. Give it up to God. Let him have that burden. Let him take that weight for you because he surely will. And I would say, do you know what? They, they, our enemy, the Satanists, the paedophiles and the paedophile protectors, 
They live in the dark realms. Everything has to be done. It's hidden and secret and covert. We don't. We don't have to have secrets. You know, we don't have to have code words and special handshakes. We don't need any of that. We will speak out. You can come forward to me, the John Wedger Foundation, J-O-N-W-E-D-G-E-R, Foundation, okay? My email, johnwedgerfoundation at gmail.com. Email me. I will put your testimony out there. I will make the world hear what you've got to say. It's not for entertainment. It's for education. Um, and in doing so, I promise you, others will come forward. You will be of such solace and comfort to others. When they hear what you've been through, they won't feel alone anymore. They will feel relieved. They will feel empowered, you know, and they will go forward to do good like you have. So please, please come forward. You have nothing to fear. They're the ones who have something to fear. There was a thing sweeping through the UK when this started getting exposed in the 1980s before the popular media and the British government shut it down and they termed it satanic panic. Well, I'll tell you something. Yes, there is satanic panic because the Satanists are panicking. Right, because we're on the move now and we're getting together and we're coming for you. And I will say to all the law enforcement agencies, you better do the right thing here. Do the right thing. Look inside yourselves to chief constables. Right, if you are involved in Satanism, repent now and stop. Stop it now. Because your friends aren't going to be able to help you. They aren't. Right? Jesus will help you. Come to the light and leave all this behind. And repent what you've done. Do it now. And I say to all those whose partners are involved in Satanism, you need to be brave and speak out. Speak out. To all those whose parents are involved, please speak out. To all those whose children are involved, speak out. And to Satanists, stop it. Stop it. Your God isn't going to help you. He is malevolent and he is a liar. He will abandon you and he will leave you and you will suffer for eternity come to Jesus he loves you no matter what he loves you and he is waiting for you all you have to do is just ask him ask him to show himself and ask him to help you it's as simple as that and stop doing it God bless Father I thank you for the work you've done in us all and I say a prayer for the United Kingdom, Lord, how it's turned its back on Christ and there's a famine of God's word. I just pray for, for things to change in this end times harvest, Lord. At the end, Lord, every knee is going to bow to your name. As we see biblical prophecy unfold before our eyes, with the mark of the beast ready, a satanic government that's making us wear face masks, and it's turned their back on a holy and righteous God. How they've taken Bibles out of school and replaced them with theology, theology of dinosaurs and all things that are impossible. We did not come from a big bang, Lord. To be a creation, there must be a creator. And I just pray for the youth in our society, a godless generation who's turned their back on God because they never got God's word. I pray for the politicians. I pray for those in high up places and I come against all spiritual wickedness in the name of Jesus for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age against the wicked hosts in heavenly places and we do stand in the evil day having our loins girded with truth we have the breastplate of righteousness the shield of faith and our head is totally covered in the helmet of salvation and our feet are shod in the gospel of peace which is the word of God the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing between the dividing you sunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that there will be an end times revival in this land. And I raise, I raise the name up of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, and I cover us in the blood of Jesus in this group. And I pray, Lord, that you will bring people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, 
and that oppression will be far from them and that they will walk in the light as Jesus is in the light and the blood of Jesus will cleanse them of all sin. The days of persecution are upon us already as true biblical believers in the word of God. And I say this today from God's word to remember us of who, who came before us and what's important to us and the church that was built on the blood of the martyrs and the saints throughout the last 2,000 years. And I thank you for every one of them, Lord. And I just pray that you count us worthy for our calling, which is in you to walk forward and boldly proclaim your name, the name of Jesus Christ. And put out the message of true repentance of one's sin and also the resurrection of the dead, which true believers do worship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.